Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the third and final Egyptology lecture in our HMSC lecture series, sponsored by the Harvard Museum of the Ancient Near East and also HMSC. As I mentioned, the final one of the semester, and the cold weather is catching up with us to show us that November is with us. We are in for a special treat tonight. Patrizia Piacentini has been professor of Egyptology and Egyptian archaeology at the University of Milan since 1993. She's also a member of the Academy of the Linchang in Rome, of the Ambrosiana Academy in Milan, and a corresponding member of the advisory committee of the Shanghai Archaeology Forum Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. In 2022, the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres in Paris awarded her the Gaston Mastereau Lifetime Achievement Award. I'm getting my language work out this evening. At the University of Milan, Dr. Piacentini sits on a variety of committees. She's been coordinator of the PhD program in Literature, Arts, and Environmental Heritage. Since 1999, she manages the scientific and organizational direction of the Egyptological Library and Archives, which she founded by collecting some spectacular archival collections and doing some impressive fundraising, making me, for one, very jealous. She's director of EMAWA, if I'm pronouncing that right. What is that? It's the Egyptian Italian Mission at West Aswan, which excavates and studies a large necropolis used from the 6th century BCE to the 3rd century CE. She serves on scientific and presidential committees of Egyptological foundations and associations, including the Fondation Schiff Giorgini in Lausanne, and has been representative for Italy of the International Association of Egyptologists from 2015 to 2023. She was also invited as a Gale Visiting Fellow of Australian Centre for Egyptology, Macquarie University in 2019 for lectures at Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, and Perth. Author of numerous monographs and scientific articles, she's organized Egyptology-themed exhibitions in various countries around the world and numerous conferences. She's also founder and editor of the journal Ibal, Egyptian and Egyptological Documents, Archives, and Libraries in Milan, and serves on the scientific or editorial boards of numerous journals, including Egyptus in Milan. Tonight, we are very lucky to have her take us south for The Mummies of Aswan, The Missing Link. Patrizia Piacentini, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. So first of all, I have to thank uh, Peter, a, a colleague and friend since uh, 30 years. So Professor Peter de Manuelian, who invited me here, and uh, I'm very happy to be here with you tonight to present our work, current work in Aswan. Um, and you know, I will tell you a nice story. Um, the place where we are working um, is um, a large cemetery that was discovered in, let's say, around 2015. Um, following uh, emergency excavation because there were uh, thieves, modern thieves there. So the, um, yeah. so the, um, the Egyptian Ministry of Foreign Antiquities called us to help them to, um, to work on the site. In fact, uh, it was not completely unknown uh, since uh, there were some tools visible, there were some mummies around, a lot of pottery, and uh, already in 1902, we know that people went there to look for mummies. This uh, picture that you see, this photo is from 1902, and there are ladies, as you can see, going up, and on the back of the photo is written, searching for mummies. <laughs> so, we are just the last people around. So we go on, and uh, so we are in Aswan, that is uh, at the southern border of uh, Egypt. Oh, what is this? Is uh, here. Okay, we are here. And the place uh, where we are working is just around, I found, yeah somewhere here, yeah, around the mausoleum of the Aga Khan III, which was established in uh, 1958. And uh, here you can see in this map, 
so this is uh, Aswan on the, on the east bank, and we are on the west bank between the San Simeon Monastery and south, uh, the Aga Khan Mausoleum. So this is the place. But Aswan is very well known for other archaeological uh, sites, and in particular, uh, the, the area of the Kubet el Hawa. Here is the Kubet el Hawa tombs, which are very well known. They are tombs uh, from the third millennium, uh, let's say the Old Kingdom, to the Middle Kingdom, beginning of the second millennium uh, BC. And uh, they are <coughs> known since uh, the 19th century as still excavated by um, Spanish and Australian teams. And then uh, uh, around there are some tombs of the New Kingdom, that is of the second uh, part of the second millennium, and that are they were discovered not many years ago. Then a part that, that is not yet explored, this part, and then south of the hill, this is the area in which we walk, this one. So it means that there were large, large, large cemetery. Uh, used for more than three millennia from the third millennium BC until the Roman times. And we are at the end of the story, so the last millennium, and the people buried there were known in their life because uh, um, we know them from uh, the town of Elefantine, from the town of Siena, that is Aswan, we have many documents, papyri, and so on and so on. But what was missing were the tombs in which they were, um, uh, that, where they, they found their last place. And so this is the reason why, why one time I, I told my people, oh, you know, we are looking for the missing link, and this is what we found. So the missing link, this is the reason of the title of this, this talk. Um, the necropolis uh, is uh, around 100,000 square meters. Uh, we are we started in the northwestern part, uh, northeastern sorry part of the <coughs> of the necropolis, and we found very different kind of uh, of graves, uh, either rock tombs, like here, you know, excavated directly into the hill, or you know this. This is, was before the excavation. There were so some tombs visible. Most of them are still under the sand. And other two, yeah, here also is a part that now is excavated. But this is was what we found um, between uh, nine, uh, 2017, 18, just before starting our work. But as I told you before, it was a very risky place because modern thieves went there, especially in 2015 when the situation was troubled in Egypt. So it was necessary to go there and explore this area. So when we started, one sentence, I mean, I, I often heard this, so what? Just more tombs, just more mummies. So I was a little troubled by this. I said, yes, more tombs, more mummies. But if we apply, if we use modern te technologies combined with the knowledge of the history of the, of the place, uh, of the people, I think we could get um, important results. So uh, I try to answer to this, um, uh, this uh, sentence that uh, hurted me a little bit when I heard the first time. First of all, we studied the previous work on the site, and there was a very important uh, Egyptian-European project in 2007 that studied the, the quarries around. You know, Aswan is very well known for uh, grand quarries and different quarries. So this was very important for us because we, we could uh, see all the paths going to the quarries. Um, everything was around. So this was the first step, and then, um, I called geologists and geophysicians from my university. They came and they studied the composition of the rocks of the place where uh, we would have worked. So Fabio Bonad is the geologist uh, in chief of the team of geologists and uh, the good, good results. And also our colleagues, the Egyptians, uh, 
uh, start walk, um, make a, a kind of survey around just before we arrived, because I was in Italy looking for money and uh, you know sort of organizing the team. So they excavated or they made a surface survey, and they found many interesting items, like you know uh, cartonnage uh, covered with gold, uh, some coffins in um, stone or in uh, pot or pottery stones, and you know. Pottery, faience, uh, that is, amulets, uh, wooden statuettes, and things like this. So it was really, really um, interesting, I think, to start. During the work of the Egyptian there, we constructed the team in Italy. And um, um, just be because I didn't want just to find some more mummies, I, I organized this. Uh, multidisciplinary team. Uh, first of all, there is a radiological and anthropological uh, uh, unit uh, to study in detail the, the mummies that we were supposed to find. Uh, there, there are paleopathologists working with us to study eventually their disease, uh, what they eat, what they, well, their life, let's say. There are chemists who are in charge of the study of, for example, the colors of the items we found, the carton, the, the bandages, everything, every object we found, we find, and also uh, the plaster on the on the inside the tombs and all the colors, everything we found. So they help us a lot. We have paleobotanists who study the the plants and uh, the seeds and everything we found on, in this field. Uh, we have, of course, historians and Egyptologists, and in particular my PhD students and Egypt, Egyptian PhD students coming with us. And to organize all the enormous amount of data that we are collecting, uh, we have uh, um, um, experts in uh, computer sciences, uh, so it's a very important unit um, working on the big data that we are collecting. In addition to this, uh, nucleus. This, this was the first uh, team. We, we have other units, so geologists, as I told you, uh, paleozoologists, uh, so zooarchaeologists, uh, of course, restorers, and then we had um, uh, topographers and experts in geomatics from the University of Bologna. Uh, they are very, very good, ex really good experts in this. We have uh, two architects who are mm, working on a master plan for um, um, the touristic, then tourism and uh, for the exp exploitation, for, for, let's say, organizing the field for the tourism in future. And the master plan now is done, and it's quite interesting. And then we work, of course, with Egyptian colleagues, and particularly with the University of Aswan, and <clears throat> we work with them for um, for the radiology, for all the exams, uh, CT scans, and so on of the mummy. Uh, we work also with the uh, Institut Français d'Archéologie Orientale in Cairo, the IFAO, uh, especially for the um, uh, C14 analysis. And then with the NEMEC, that is the National Museum of Egyptian Civilization in Cairo, we work for the um, DNA uh, analysis. So it's a large team, but uh, we work all together in quite good uh, terms. It's, it's good. It's nice to work there with them. Um, let's see what we are doing. So in Egypt, uh, and especially in Aswan, it's absolutely uh, impossible to use drones. So our topographers uh, had to use other uh, uh, things, and they, uh, we bought a lot of uh, satellite images. Uh, they work on them uh, to understand better the situation, general situation of the of the place. But also, uh, we um, we check regularly, uh, let's say almost every week, uh, how the situation is um, about the thieves, because there are still thieves, could be thieves there. So we look at eventually, you know, some. No, this is okay. These are places that where we excavated, but south of the mausoleum of the other Khan, we saw last year some holes uh, made by thieves. Uh, 
the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities in Egypt asked us to uh, um, hire guards. We have five guards, 24 hours a day, uh, on the site. So they do what they can. And uh, since uh, their presence in, in situ, uh, things are going much better. But we are always concerned about this. And, uh, but almost all the area is now secured. We put electricity there. It was not easy. Uh, you know, over there we have no water, no electricity, we have nothing. But now there is. So they can work easily on the site. And uh, we hope at the end. Um, these are the work of the topographers. Uh, here you can see very well the area. This is the enclosure of the Aga Khan mausoleum. This is the villa of the Aga Khan. So our work was, first of all, on the north, northeastern sector here, and then um, on the west, and then uh, we are starting on the, in the, on the southern part of the, of the necropolis. As I told you, it's around 100,000 meters. And we really excavated on uh, more or less 25,000 square meters. Uh, this uh, um, red circle is a, a tomb that we chose as a case study that we explored ex in, ex in detail for a couple of years, a couple of missions, let's say. And I will show you later what, we, what were the results that we obtained. And of course, the topographers uh, did all this kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, job on the on the surface to uh, better better on the fix on the on the on the floor. Yeah. Okay. So this was the first map of the site. Here you can see uh, around 250 tombs on the plan. Uh, now we are um, we we have uh, around 400 tombs on plan. Uh, here you can see our, some of our topographers, Stefano Nava and Mohammed, uh, who work together to <coughs> establish this, uh, this map. Okay, you can read what they use, uh, all these very, very up-to-date instruments to really locate every single thing we, we, we find, and also to, uh, of course, doing digit photogrammetry, uh, trying to reconstruct every single thing, because in case something, uh, you know, we want to reconstruct in, a, in Italy, abroad, for an exhibition, whatever, or just to study them, I mean, mostly to study them, we need to have all this documentation. And uh, so this is a, a large part of the work done by the, geol the um, engineer and, and the expert in geomatics and um, and also, part of the work is train, to train the Egyptian colleagues uh, in all these uh, up-to-date techniques. So, uh, Professor Gabriele Bitelli and um, his assistant, former assistant, now Professor Emanuele Mandanici, are really working on, uh, on the site for us, for the mission, but also to train uh, our inspectors in this kind of work with um, every year with new instruments and so on. And now they are fixing some, uh, uh, you know, they fix some points uh, so that the necropolis, even if one day it will be covered by sand or whatever, we will know exactly where the different tools are. And this is our generator, and we are very proud of it. Finally, we have electricity on site. So, the, in fact, that this was a case study I told you about at Tomb 26. Um, I decided to start in a place where there was nothing. Um, so there are some um, techniques um, that we follow. And first of all, uh, where there is nothing, um, I, I just, so in the desert, I saw uh, a small depression in the sand, and also the yellow sand that you see everywhere. Uh, somewhere it was mixed with uh, gray uh, sand. Uh, and gray, for us, is a sign that perhaps there are dry um, mud bricks, mud bricks uh, that are made in, uh, with organic materials. Uh, so when they decompose, they be, the, the, sand be, the, the, the half become gray. So this was a place like this. And also we saw a hole made by thieves, but luckily they didn't go anywhere. It was just a hole. So in a very simple way, with my assistant, we put stones here. 
and I told the workers, okay, let's, let's start there. Let's make a survey because there are many possibilities, there are possibilities that it's a good place to find something completely uh, untouched. And this was the case. Uh, let's say a couple of days later, this was the entire, you know, the tomb was discovered. We started from here, exactly where I put the stones, and then, you know, slowly we found all the, 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 the tomb, and these are the steps, the upper part of the steps going down, and you see they are definitely gray, and all the sand is covering the tomb. In fact, uh, the, these tombs excavated underground were not covered by wood or other, uh, other things, but they were, were just uh, closed with sand, so completely filled with sand. And uh, excavating more, so these are the the steps going down under excavation, we found a wall, it's here, and this was uh, built during a, okay, during a second uh, a reuse of the tomb. So the first part of the tomb was, in, uh, was let's say, third century BC, and the second part was uh, uh, Roman time, was first century uh, of this era. So this is the, the tomb once excavated. This is from inside to outside. So you, here you can see all this, the steps. Um, so from inside you can see the, the steps. The, um, these are rock steps. On the upper part, uh, mud brick steps. And uh, we are inside the main room of the tomb of the Ptolemaic um, era, Ptolemaic period. So I told you around third century BCE. Um, of course, we looked for parallels. Uh, somewhere else in Egypt, there are similar tombs. This is in Dush. It's an oasis in the Western Desert, um, which is, I mean, it's far from Aswan, but it's a more or less same latitude. And there are many, many similarities. So we had to have a look at the t tomb in Dush, and this one is, exa I mean, is exactly the same, let's say. Uh, you can see here all these mummies, all these individuals inside the tomb of Dush. And in fact, in our tomb, in tomb 26, it was the same situation. But unfortunately, in our tomb, um, modern thieves didn't go. I mean, the tomb was completely um, uh, closed, but ancient thieves went there, probably uh, just at the end of the Roman period or perhaps a little later. But not so much, probably third century um, current, uh, CE. So the situation is very similar, and uh, not only for the structure of the, of the tombs, but also for the object we, found in, uh, we find in them. So this is really the nearest parallel. Uh, in, um, the tomb presented two rooms. The upper one was uh, excavated in Roman times, or at least occupied in Roman times, and the main one was uh, of uh, uh, Ptolemaic period. When we opened the first uh, room, the first we found, we, you know, as you can see, it was mixed with every kind of things, with stones, and these kind of stones were used as a bed for the mummies very often. And then we found uh, something strange here, covered with sand. And you know, this was a mixed situation. So excavating this, we found a lot of cartonnage that are, um, as probably you, you probably know, they are made with uh, linen or uh, old papyrus mixed with plaster and then painted. So we found a lot. They were on mummies. In this room, after excavation, we found four mummies. Uh, three were intact. Uh, one, unfortunately, were, uh, had been broken by the, the ancient thieves. But excavating this, we also found seeds. And the, even uh, us, as Egyptologists, looking at them, we thought perhaps there are pine nuts. And in fact, our botanists told us, yes, and they, of course they made the exam, but they were sure they were pine nuts from Pinus Pinea, and this was a nice surprise because this is quite rare, quite rare in Egypt. Um, 
um, Pinus pinea is uh, imported in Egypt. It was imported already in the third millennium BC from Anatolia, but uh, mostly uh, in um, late period and Roman times from Italy. So uh, this is uh, another proof that uh, the people in, uh, buried here were probably, we are not sure, but in any case they're probably Roman and they have um, uh, funerary items made like Egyptians. They, they lived there, but some, um, some things made we think that they were from, at least the origins were Roman. Um, I told you uh, uh, pine nuts, pine cones were rare in Egypt, but not, it's, it was not an apas, not only one we found. And a colleague of mine, uh, um, Professor Paola Davoli, who works in, uh, in Lecce, in southern Italy, uh, she works in Fayum, in an oasis not far from Cairo, and she found uh, in Dime, in uh, Socno Paionesos Dime, a lot of pine cones. And these excavations are also of, uh, this, the, there is a large temple, and it's mostly uh, Roman too. So this is a really another interesting connection of in Roman times. So now I show you the interior of the, the, of the room A, of the, the first room we excavated, so we found completely mixed with everything. And now is when the work was finished. Uh, we found um, a sarcophagus uh, excavated into the rock, and here there was the main, uh, mm, perhaps the, the main person of, the, of this uh, room. And this was a mummy that was broken um, because the, the thieves, what, they cut the, the cover of the coffin, they cut in two, they went inside looking for perhaps jewels or whatever, and um, so they destroyed the, the, the body inside. But uh, just uh, on, the, on the left of the coffin, we found three mummies. So one intact and two, we will see one over the other. And um, they were covered with cartonnage and there were a lot of uh, pottery with, uh, with them. And so these are the two mummies we found uh, in room A. Uh, they were one over the other, uh, one longest, one shorter. So the first thing we thought, it was, oh, it's a mother with uh, uh, her child. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, so and they are uh, so now. Th this is the moment in which we, we took out, uh, but they are clean now and they are intact. And in fact, uh, they were. Uh, we did a CAT scan, uh, CT scan of them last uh, last May, and in fact, we discovered they are not mother and child, but they are two children, two sub adults. I mean, perhaps uh, uh, thirteen and eleven, something like this. And uh, so uh, the, the mother was a lady, just the other mummy just near them. And perhaps the father was the, the mummy, which was found uh, almost destroyed inside the coffin. So it's a family. Uh, we are not sure if they are, because they have still to go under uh, DNA analysis. But at least we know that we are not in front of mother and child, but of two children. And uh, so now um, these are the, te the, the, the work we, we, we did uh, during 2023, the last two missions. Um, first of all, in Cairo, at the NEMEC, at the DNA laboratory, we uh, choose the mummies to be uh, studied. And f first of all, the two mummies that I showed you. And this is an amazing laboratory. We work uh, in a wonderful way with them. So these are two girls of my team, Alice and Benedetta, and two Egyptian, young Egyptian colleagues uh, working in the laboratory. And here uh, is a moment in which we prepare the mummy. In, this is in Aswan, uh, going to the hospital for the CT scan. And uh, uh, this is Dr. Carmelo Messina, who is the chief of the radiology unit. And uh, at that moment, uh, uh, the, the, the coroner, we have a coroner, coroner with us, who is Professor um, Cristina Catania. She was not there at the moment, uh, and the two Egyptian colleagues. So we were waiting for going to the, to the hospital. So this was another part very important of our work. 
Uh, and of course, there is, let's say, normal work for Egyptologists, that is the, the work on pottery, which is really, really important for us. And uh, so you can see here all the steps, you know, from excavation. Uh, this is uh, Roman pottery. Uh, there are amphora with the, uh, there was uh, wine inside. And uh, okay, many, many, many fragments that we restore in our, in the laboratory of, uh, in the magazine, in the entrepot uh, of the ministry, and the drawings, and study, and so on. So this is the usual work of an Egyptologist and of a Ceremologist at work. And we found a lot, a lot of cartonnage. So these are photos of the, the moment of the discovery. There was um, an angle, a, a corner of the, of the room B of the tomb 26 full of cartonnage. We found more than 25. That means that all, all the mummies were covered with cartonnage, but they were broken by the thieves, by the ancient thieves, to look for precious things or whatever. But they were not interested in cartonnage, so they left uh, on one corner, and uh, so now we are very happy because we can study them really in detail and look for parallels and study the colors and study everything about uh, these uh, uh, items. Uh, so these are some of them out of the tomb. First uh, you know, moment when we clean, most of them are covered with gold, as you can see here or here, or here, the nails, the sandals. I mean, this is all and you know, different colors and gold. Then we um, bring them to the, uh, to the inspectorate in Aswan, and this is the laboratory where they are restored and uh, studied. Um, but a lot of work is done on the site. And uh, so we have our uh, scientists, uh, you know, professors from the University of Milan, uh, chemists who work on site and try to use uh, uh, their instruments. It's difficult because uh, the light is very, very uh, hard, very strong, and the heat is uh, important. Um, this is a normal day uh, in, uh, in spring. You see 43, 42, 37 it was, good. It was a good day. Uh, of course, it's uh, Celsius, huh? 39, 44, 43. Uh, this is uh, okay, but uh, we arrived also to 48 uh, um, Celsius uh, degrees. And at this mo point, it's difficult for people, of course, for us, but it's very, very difficult for instruments. So this is a, uh, a challenge for our, uh, our colleagues because they, t they have to do something on site before moving the objects, but from time to time it's difficult. Uh, difficult. And of course, the final step is uh, in the inspectorate where they can work in a dark room and do what they have to do. And especially they have to study, they, they, I mean, they decided to study the colors used. And this is not just to know that it's red or blue or, or, I mean, or okra or whatever, but uh, it's, it can be important also for the, I mean, they explained me, for the, the, the kind of material use that can be imported, for example, let's say from uh, subtropical Africa, from the west, from the east. So we are looking also for the problem because Aswan is really a crossroad. The, the people mi are mixed there and they bring with them uh, many I mean, pottery or things and, and they, they bring themselves. So we are really looking for this cross-cultural uh, milieu uh, that, is, uh, that was a swan and that is still today a swan. Um, so here just uh, some, uh, some study they did. What is inter interesting is the use of the Egyptian blue and uh, our chemist explained me that uh, um, you know, when you use a, Egyptian blue is um, the first synthetic uh, color used in, uh, in, an, in antiquity. And uh, this is a particular reaction it has with special lights. So they could recognize immediately what is Egyptian blue and what are other different uh, colors uh, used for this, uh, for decorating this cartonnage. And uh, of course it's useful to have uh, photogrammetry and other programs to reconstruct, to, I mean, to see the object at, on every side and um, 
to study and to show to our students when we are back from Egypt. So we did this for every single object and also for tombs. Uh, we have the, this kind of reconstruction for at least, complete for two tombs, and we are completing uh, three other tombs. But all the objects have been uh, now reproduced in three, three dimensions. So this is one of the, for me, one of the most important things we found. Uh, in, also in tomb, in tomb uh, 26, um, we found you know, wood, some pieces of wood. But when we saw them outside, we understood that it was a funerary bed. And the bed um, in the middle has a long, long uh, uh, text complete. Exactly. I mean, you could read like a newspaper today. It was perfect. And um, a parallel to this uh, funerary bed, which is quite uh, often found in, uh, in um, Ptolemaic tombs, uh, uh, you can see in the Louvre Museum, this is just an example, uh, this is the, the famous mummy of the Louvre, Belfagor. And uh, uh, you can see down the funerary bed. It's exactly like ours when it... Uh, it will be reconstructed. So it's wood, and in the middle, I don't know if you can see here, this is the, the part inscribed. And our bed is exactly the same. And the mummy uh, that was on it was dressed like this one with cartonnage and the mask and so on. So it's really a parallel of our uh, uh, finding and uh, it's uh, clearly 3rd, 2nd uh, uh, century BCE. And uh, um, we, we could uh, know from this inscription who was probably the first owner of the tomb. Um, so I wrote that for the moment, for reading the text, we don't use we don't, for the moment, AE, but we just copy the text, we, and then we do digital epigraphy like, like Peter, but for the moment, this was the moment in which I was so excited because we found this complete inscri inscription. So we, I just copied it and, and translate, and it was a tomb, I mean, the, the funerary bed of Pamerich, the name is written here, uh, Pamerich, and his main title was the chief of the army of Aswan. And uh, the rest of inscription says that uh, um, his father um, um, made the same, had the same job. He was also chief of the army of Aswan, so he was an important, they were important people. And there, were, there is a name of the mother and so on, and some um, funerary expression. But the, the most important part is the name and the title of the owner. Um, so this was very easy to read. But uh, there are other inscriptions that we found which are not so clear. So we tried with our technician um, to um, uh, use, I mean, they use infrared, they use other uh, techniques to try to read better. From time to time it works, from time to time it doesn't. But uh, uh, we, we go on and we try to read all the things that we find. And of course, we, um, after we put in our repository, so the, I show just a part of the, of the inscription, of course, the same I, I showed before. So the facsimile, the hieroglyphic transcription, and, uh, and the translation, this is our, <coughs> uh, we have these kind of things for every object we, we, we find. And these are our professor of uh, computer sciences who prepared this kind of uh, repository. We found also strange things, not uh, common things. Um, here we are in room B, and that is the, the oldest room of the tomb 26. Um, what you see here is our commingled, um, you know, mixed uh, bones and bandages and objects and everything. And at the end, and then the, the northern wall of the tomb, we found a very strange thing, and we took out, and it's this one. It's a stretcher made uh, of palm wood and uh, linen strips, and it was uh, intact. And this was used to put the mummy inside the, the tomb, and uh, at the end, they left uh, inside the tomb. And again, it's an object not, uh, not common. I mean, dif it's difficult to find it because it's very fragile. Uh, and uh, again, in douche, 
they found a, a similar uh, stretcher, and this is a, the, the closest parallel that we found of our uh, stretcher. And this, uh, we have, of course, a 3D model of it. We didn't try, but I think. And this is, oh, this is my favorite. So inside this tomb, we found uh, at some point, we, we noted some color and some wood really almost destroyed. So this is the moment in which we saw the face of uh, the Pantera Pardus, the leopard. And then we excavated it very, very carefully. But it was extreme, I mean, at the end, it was almost a small, small piece of, of nothing, I mean. But our restorer did miracles. They restored it. But first of all, they made a digital reconstruction of uh, this. Uh, so this is, um, it was probably um, the, the upper part of, um, of a box, probably, because it's not very big. Uh, could be also part of a funerary bed, but I don't think so. Probably it was just a box. But we found only this part, because the rest, the, 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 the bone was completely destroyed. So let's go on, because I'm, I, think it's, I think it's late, yes. Uh, so this is another kind of, uh, of tomb we excavated. Uh, this is uh, in the lowest part of the necropolis, not far from the river, not far from the Embarcadero, in fact, the ancient Embarcadero. And this is a wadi, that is, is a kind of, uh, of path going up to the necropolis. And right in the middle, the, it, this was co almost completely covered by sand. There was just the upper part of a wall that was visible when we made the, the, the survey. Uh, so we decided to excavate here. And at the end, we found this structure, which is probably a place for cults, for, for offerings, and things like this. Uh, in fact, uh, this wall in particular was covered by hundreds of animal bones, um, and uh, especially there were rams. Uh, and uh, this is not strange because this was a common uh, offer, and probably it was an offering place for at least one part of the necropolis. We never, um, we, we, let's say, until now. We didn't see anything like this in the necropolis. So um, we excavated the, the cultic place before this structure. Uh, and then when cleaning inside, we saw that under the, the floor there was something. And so we excavated more. And in fact, under the, this cultic place, we found the tomb. And this is the entrance of the tomb. So it was exactly here, under under here. So uh, we went on. Uh, oh, OK. Before uh, going down, we excavated outside, and there was a mummy that, again, for sure, by ancient thieves, was kept out of the tomb. And on the mummy, we found a necklace, this one. And uh, our expert, Professor Cavagna, he is an historian, very expert in Greek inscriptions. He studied it, and we found another name. This sign was a Greek one. It was Nicostratos. So now we are trying. So we found a Roman, uh, but with an Egyptian name. No, uh, no, Roman in, in the tomb. We have no names. The, the, um, uh, in, inside the Ptolemaic room of 26, we found Pamerich. Uh, here in 32, we found somebody with a Greek name, Nicostratos and also the inscription to the Sunai Theoi, to, to all the, the gods, was um, in, uh, in this tomb under the cultic place. And this is inside. So this is very interesting. The tomb was, there was a fire inside the tomb. We think that probably the thieves, the ancient thieves, went inside with torches. At some point, everything burned. And um, so this is the entrance. And then inside, there are four galleries. Mm -hmm. They are 60 centimeters high, so it's not very easy to walk inside. And they are very, very long. So I mean, two of them are very long, two, it's easy, two easier. So here, you can, you can find, uh, you can see them almost clean. So this is room one, room two, with some mummies burnt. 
and this is room three and four. Uh, these are before excavation. You still can see some bodies, some things. This was difficult to, to because everything was mixed because of the thieves and because of the fire. But um, we could, uh, um, in any case, we could uh, um, study 52 individuals who were buried here, of course, in different moments. And there were families, and there were people put in the tomb later on. So this was a, a, an enormous work for our anthropologists. But at the end, they could reconstruct 52 people. Some mummies were, were good, others less. And so we are inside the tomb 32, so under the cultic place. And um, we noted that um, in both graves, uh, our two case studies, so tomb 26 and tomb 32, two, there were no children. Um, uh, we found also newborn uh, children. And uh, most of them, many of them at least, uh, had uh, problems. Um, t um, you know, these uh, cryobiotic lesions uh, that are indicative of uh, nutritional deficiencies and metabolic problems during growth. So these are very interesting to study for, an uh, interesting chapter for our anthropologists because they are trying to study um, all the disease and the reasons why, the reasons why all these people all these children died. Of course, it was normal at that time, uh, but, uh, but so many in these tombs are interesting. So we are still working on this and trying to understand. Uh, and also, we found, uh, um, especially in this tomb, in tomb 32, uh, families. So the, the man, the woman, and the child very often under uh, the, the, the legs of the father or of the mother. So it was touching, I have to say, and, um, and it's a challenge. We, we, I mean, anthropologists uh, and our coroners are working on this. So for each of them, this, uh, ah, this was the baby we found, the children we found uh, inside this coffin. This was really, it, it was moved by the ancient thieves in front of the, of the entrance. And uh, so first of all, we studied him uh, on site with a, a portable X-ray, and then uh, uh, he went to the uh, to the CT scan uh, last May. So we, I mean, uh, the doctors are studying every single thing uh, about him. And um, at the at the beginning, when we made the X-ray on the site, we thought he had a, a, a plaque or something on the chest. But in fact, uh, doing a CT scan uh, last May, um, they, uh, the doctors understood that uh, there were just bones uh, that were not in, in, in situ, not in place anymore. So it was not something to read or, or other things inside. So this is the moment in which we went to, to the um, uh, hospital, uh, university hospital in Aswan for the CT scans of our, our friends, our mummies. Uh, so Professor Messina and his colleague uh, uh, of the University of Aswan doing the, uh, the exams. Uh, it, was, um, uh, it produced a lot of data that our um, team is still studying. And OK, so this is uh, also the, our, uh, the children we saw before. Uh, so he has no plaques, pla uh, nothing inside, but they, sh um, they could see um, bracelets you know, at the, at the two wrists. And so it was, as we do now, a virtual unwrapping of the mummies that we can't, of course, open. Uh, but uh, with CT scan and all the other exams that, uh, that uh, uh, we, are, we are doing on them, you know, we can understand a lot of things. And especially, our doctors can study all the all kind of diseases, even studying the bones. I mean, I'm learning a lot of things from them. And uh, for example, they from just from a vertebra, they could understand that uh, there is evidence of tuberculosis. That was a sickness very very common in Egypt, and it's, it's still common uh, nowadays. So starting from this, even on the site, looking at them, say, 
this is tuberculosis, and then, of course, they continue to, to study. And we have different cases. This is a case of uh, uh, a lady uh, with possible amputation of the leg. And in fact, the woman uh, survived because the, the bone reconstructed itself. And we, we, we did a study, we published, a, um, especially where our doctor who uh, published an article on, uh, on this, uh, this case, which, which is really interesting. And uh, you, you can see here the nice eyes of uh, my former PhD student, now good anthropologist and Egyptologist, Alice who is, uh, is uh, studying uh, a skull here, uh, another here. And uh, from this year, we have also in the team a specialist in uh, a, a dentist uh, who is very, will be very useful to study all these teeth that we find. And, uh, and here, again, they are you know, analyzing uh, on in situ. First of all, they analyze the bodies and then they, they go to, to the hospital and we do all the, all the exams. So for us, I have to say, of, of course, it's important to find objects. So it's fantastic to find descriptions, but really to meet the people, to study them, to understand how they lived, why, what, what were, were the sickness, uh, what they did in life, or what they, uh, from time to time, we, ca you, we can also say, in case what they what was they work because of the knees when the knees are are broken in some some way perhaps it was I don't know uh, a priest always praying on his knees or perhaps other words I mean every, you can interfere you can understand a lot of uh, things about these uh, people so uh, yes there are mummies there but first of all there are men women children people that we are discovering again. And uh, um, there is also an ethic problem about all this. So uh, let's say that um, the entire mummies, of course, go to the inspectorate, and perhaps one day they will go to a museum. But uh, what we try to do after the work of the doctors, after our study of uh, their bandages, their description, everything, we recompose the body in a very good way and we put again in the tomb as they were before the ancient thieves went inside. And then we close the, 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 the tombs with iron doors and they will rest forever. And if we need to see them again, we go inside, but they are all well uh, established in their tombs. So it's a, I think it's a good thing to... Um, of course, we need to know them, but after them, after that, they rest in peace in their tombs. So, um, studying the, the the skulls and the bodies, we understand also. We try to understand the provenance of these people, and uh, we have at least uh, two um, subtropical uh, people, uh, let's say Negroid type. Um, type uh, one is from the tomb 35 that we'll be see very quickly in a few minutes. And um, this is a marked prognathism, which is a sign of, um, uh, let's say, ethnicity, even if we can't really use this word anymore. Another, another doubtful ca case of a Nubian is from another tomb. And this, uh, this was understood by our specialists because of the nose. And there are some uh, special, you know, these are <clears throat> all the instruments they use in situ before doing other exams. And there are, you know, um, uh, measurements for um, each type of, uh, uh, let's say, ethnicity. Ancestry, we have to use the, more, the word ancestry, sorry. And also, um, uh, again, this is uh, Alice Tomaino with Marco Cumaudo, who is uh, uh, really a, a specialist in, uh, he's a coroner, coroner too, uh, is explaining to one of our Egyptian inspectors um, what was, this was a, um, a broken uh, leg, but, um, uh, I mean, uh, ah, I, I can't find the word in English, anyway. Um, so they, they are studying the single bone for 
accidents, let's say, and also with this instrument, with, with this uh, scanner, they are um, um, preparing the, the 3D modeling of every single bone uh, that w will be used when back from Egypt uh, to reconstruct everything and to better study these things. So this is work in situ again. This was an adventure because, you know, another problem that we have is to import to Egypt uh, instruments. Uh, this is it's difficult. It's not. It's, it's a challenge. And this was the portable X-ray uh, finally arriving in Aswan. Uh, the vice director of the mission, my friend Massimiliana Pozzi, and Professor Alfonsino D'Amato. They are so happy because this stayed one month at the custom in Cairo before arriving in Aswan. So when we had it, it was good. So uh, we could make uh, uh, X-ray in situ before mo moving the mummies. The problem that day, days in when we, we did this, it was um, uh, the, uh, the end of June, beginning of July. It was around 50 degrees Celsius. And the instrument could work until 50. 50 was the maximum. But it was OK. So we got the results. And we got the first uh, X-ray of all the bodies. Uh, so now, very, very quickly, the last, uh, the, uh, last discoveries, uh, other tombs uh, excavated uh, in the northern part of the necropolis. This was interesting because we discovered that, that they were on terraces, but not only two, three terraces, as you can see in Middle Egypt or even in Luxor in other sites. We counted at least 10 terraces, 10 uh, 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 no, and uh, in every one there were um, at least uh, 10, 20 tombs, one near the other with a small court in front of them. So this is one you can see, you know, on the terrace. So this is the court in front of, a small court in front of the tomb, and then down to uh, this tomb. This is 33. In fact, we couldn't excavate inside because uh, our geologists told us that it was too dangerous. So we couldn't go, we just go for a couple of photos at, and photogrammetry, but we couldn't excavate. So I think there, there is not a treasure of Tutankhamun down, but it's not excavated. So, but I think there was I mean, not, not a lot of things. Uh, just under 33, we found the tomb 34. Uh, so, and you can see the terrace is here. This is another terrace. And this will be another one. You see the Nile there. So we are not far from the Embarcadero. And in fact, here is the cultic place. It's, it's 32 with the tomb under it. So it, this is the northern part of the necropolis, the nearest to the Embarcadero, to the Nile. Uh, inside this tomb, in which we, we, we could go, um, there are uh, two uh, rooms in, under, uh, um, under the, 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 the ground. And there were five, five six mummies inside. One of them was uh, with Nubian type. And again, we see the terraces uh, excavated uh, last March and May, so the, during the last two campaigns. And what we will do in the next campaign, probably in February, March of the next year, we will continue on these terraces to, um, we, will, we are trying to clean all the hill down to the Nile. And in the same time, we will go up to the top of the hill to continue excavating the, um, uh, probably the most important tombs. We understood that uh, on this part, this, uh, on the terraces, there are probably I don't, I don't say low-class people, but less important people. While at the top of the, of the hill, there were really the important persons. There was Pamelik, the chief of the army of Aswan. There were you know, the most important officials on the top. And yeah, just to finish, again, uh, a tomb really of a, a modest tomb, not a very important tomb. The last one we excavated, tomb 35. It's uh, with a, as usually with a small court in front. These were two small tombs with uh, just a couple of mummies inside. They were very, <clears throat> very small with a, not a lot of things. And I want to, to conclude, I have 
just two or three uh, slides more. Uh, this, I think, is one of the most important tombs of uh, the necropolis until now. This was, uh, I mean, as you see for the number, this is tomb 18, and this was excavated uh, uh, at the beginning. And um, it's extremely important because this tomb was of uh, Persian time. That is, uh, it's uh, at the end of the 6th century BC. It's on the front of the hill. Uh, and uh, as you can see, it's a small tomb with a small court in front, but still the decoration is preserved. The style is not really Egyptian. I mean, the subject is Egyptian, but the style is not. And, and what, uh, I mean, I showed you just a little bit here. Uh, there is an Aramaic inscription. Uh, so Aramaic was the official language of, um, of the time. And um, um, it's extremely rare in Egypt to find this kind of inscription in tombs. So we know uh, from Elephantina, from the island just in front of us, just in front of uh, the necropolis, that uh, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of papyri were found uh, uh, written in Aramaic, and that they were the, uh, written by the Jewish com uh, community of uh, living on the, um, on the island. But we didn't know tombs with this kind of inscription. And so this is one. Uh, and I left for, the, for almost for the end. So this is probably a tomb of a certain Maran Setar. Um, he was an official trained in Phoenician Aramaic sphere. We don't know really uh, who was. Um, we are studying uh, the, the title he, he bore. Um, it's, the description is difficult, so the, the professor of Semitic studies working with us is still working on it. But uh, we still hope to find other tombs of this period. But this is the reason why we can say that the necropolis was used from the Persian times, so 6th century, end of the 6th century BCE, until at least the 3rd century uh, CE, while the Christian tombs, the Coptic tombs, are northern, near, um, near to the monastery of San Simeon. But 1,000 years of, of people, of tombs, we have here. So this is our work, and of course, we, uh, this is, okay, this is Professor Bellandi, our computer science professor, with his teams of all working with us. Uh, he prepared for, they prepare for us a repository that will be open access. It's not because it, we are still putting all the data inside and working on them. We have a website, of course, and um, of course, we have, you know, for more popular information, we have a, a, a we have a, um, Instagram page, so we can see here some of the, uh, you know, the team, and these are part of the teams with Egyptian and everybody. We are, we are happy when we are there. <laughs> and of course, uh, education is important for us. Uh, education for Egyptian children, for Italian children. This is a booklet that we did. Uh, it was designed by Stefano Nava and uh, written by Massimia Rapozzi and myself. Uh, so you can see here. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, you know, it's uh, half in Italian, half in uh, in uh, Arabic, of course, and uh, the small Tamerik is explaining to children what we are, we are doing in this place, and uh, and th this was a joke that uh, Stefano did to uh, to me as a director of the team and to the the general the general director of Aswan. He's the general director. He's, this is me, and <laughs> so and. This is, it was fun for us, but the children are crazy about this. So this is nice. And with this, so I thank you very much for your attention, and thank you, Peter, for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.